Welcome to Radnor Studio 21. My name is Linda Hirschman and this is Relationship Matters. My guest today is Chris Pistori of Mainline Family Law Center. And today we're going to be talking about gray divorce. And I'd like to start out by asking Chris, what is gray divorce? Well, Linda, first, thank you for having me on this program. It's a sincere pleasure to be here. Um, well, I, you know, from my perspective, gray divorce as a mediator of divorce, uh, we usually think about a couple that's um, interested together or one, um, one of them has a plan to divorce. And they're in, in an age range typically uh, between 50 to 55 years and up. Okay, now... I hesitate to say 50 because I'm 50 myself, so that would put me in a gray category too. But, Surprise! Yeah. <laughs> but um, from my perspective and my experience, uh, more of the types of cases, the gray divorce cases we get are couples that have been married for many years, you know, typically 15, 20, 25, 30 plus years perhaps. There's also gray divorces where the divorces are shorter in length, where a couple may uh, divorce later on in life. Uh, or get married later on in life and then divorce, so in either case. A long time ago, my grandmother told me a story. She had gone to a 50th anniversary party that some friends of hers were having for themselves. And about two weeks later, the woman left. My grandmother asked her, why now after 50 years? And her answer was, I just couldn't stand it anymore. And at that time when my grandmother told me this story, it was a shocking story. And yet now when we hear that, we're not so shocked the way we used to be. What is the incidence of gray divorce as compared to the general population? Well, I, I would say we've done some studies within our firm, and I would say that um, right now it's, it's trending upwards as opposed to the general population. Um, and, um, and that has been the case for the past, I would say, five to ten years. Um, and you may ask, what, you, know, what, you know, what do you attribute that to? I mean, there may be a number of different reasons. In, in, my, in, in, in my case, in our experiences, and I think, Linda, you and I have had discussions on this before. Mm -hmm. um, I like to look at it as sort of the post-9-11 uh, generation, in, in, in a sense, where I believe everything changed after. A lot, a lot of our society changed after that big event, and I hate to make reference to that awful day, but um, from, our, from our standpoint and from what I've been able to observe, um, there, has, there was a shift. Something happened after that event. Um, and it um, gave someone permission, I think, because they, they um, saw something like that happen and they're thinking, well, you know, life is precious. It's too, it's, it's, it's too short and we could all be gone tomorrow, you know, and I know that's fatalistic, but, um, but something happened, I believe, from that point forward and, and that's not the only reason, but um, you know, this is what we see in our firm in terms of um, couples and the attitudes that they, they bring with them when they come to a gray divorce. You know, that this is my time um, and I'm ready now to move forward and I've given myself permission. As you said, we've had conversations about this and in doing some research on this, one of the things that I found is that the while the incidence of divorce in the general population has either remained steady or even decreased slightly since the late 1990s, the incidence of gray divorce is has doubled and seems to be continuing to increase exponentially. From your perspective, who is most likely to pursue a gray divorce? You mean in, in terms of the husband and wife, which, which member? Of well, the marriage? that's that a good asking? question. Oh. And also, are there certain life situations or certain types of people who mm -hmm. are more inclined? 
Yeah, and it's a good question. In terms of which gender initiates the divorce, it's really across the board. But we, we find, though, that it's a little bit top-heavy towards the wife in our mediation cases. And typically they are couples that have been married for a long time, you know, in excess of 15, 20, 25, 30 years. They typically have adult children uh, that have, are grown. They've, they've been raised already. Um, and the couple reaches a point where, you know, they come to a crossroads. Do we stay or do we go? And that's where your work comes in uh, uh, so importantly in that case of discernment, you know, do we stay, do we go? Um, but, you know, usually it's these types of uh, dynamics in a couple, but not all the time, not all the time. Again, you have folks that are older that ha already had a marriage and then had a second marriage. And that second marriage also fails, unfortunately, because the incident of the incidence of marriage number two and marriage number three and subsequent divorces the incidence of divorce just keeps rising, unfortunately. That, that's what the statistics show anyway. So, But more, most typically, a long-term marriage with children, 20, 25, 30 years, the dynamic. And, you know, it has been more so the, the wife that's been initiating, although it is across, it can be across the board. Do you have any thoughts on why it's the wife who's initiating? Well, um, you know, again, I, I use this idea of, I, I, or I mentioned this idea earlier about permission, and, and um, I, you know, I want to be careful I don't sound sexist at all because it's not my intent. Um, but if you think about throughout the history of time and, uh, you know, the, the woman's, let's say, role or place traditionally in a marriage, you know, over time, um, that's changed now. You know, women, you know, uh, are, um, are out there, they're, they're earning now close to, uh, uh, or similar to men now, and they 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 have seen over time that they've been able to establish their own lives, their own financial freedom, um, and that being the case, they're they're more courageous now. If they want to leave a marriage, they feel more courageous about the other side and what that looks like for them, and um, you know, and so they give themselves that permission now to take that next step, whereas before perhaps they might have been trapped, as you gave the example earlier, trapped in an unhappy marriage for so many years, um, and, they, and they're resigned to it and they can't get out. You know, now they feel that they have permission to get out if they're feeling stuck. And again, in our discussions and in my research, one of the things I learned that I thought was fascinating is that gray divorce is not just an American issue. This is happening with increasing frequency all over the world. Mm -hmm. And in some countries, it speaks to the fact that divorce has been legalized and has become something that women could obtain where they mm -hmm. couldn't before. And in other instances, it has to do with the fact that women do tend to have more financial power now. Mm -hmm. Correct. What are the pros of getting divorced at this stage of life? Both, and, and I'm talking about in a general sense, whether it's financial, legal ramifications, health issues, whatever, you know, whatever kinds of pros. Mm -hmm. Well, first, the legal ramifications. I mean, the, the, the legal ramifications of a divorce are really always the same. You know, they, you're, somebody uh, files a divorce or couples intend a divorce, and, you know, the, 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 the laws will apply as they apply under the divorce code. Uh, so there's really that not much different on that end. Um, the, if you think about the uh, emotional and financial pro pros, let's say first, let's take the pros first, and, you know, um, fi uh, emotionally first, um, because people are in general, we're living longer, right? We're, we're assuming healthier lifestyles, and when we get to now 55, 60 years old, we have it perhaps another, you know, lifetime after that to look forward to, in a sense, you know, a new beginning, let's say. Uh, so, Spouses are beginning to see this. Hey, I, I feel I'm, I'm healthy. I'm going to live longer, and 
I just want to change. You know, I, I want to get, or maybe I'm in a, an insufferable situation. I need to get out. Now I can because I've got all this time left to live, and I don't. And I, you know, I better make, you know, make haste of it and get out of this marriage so that I can enjoy a better life for myself. So, so there's that aspect as well. Um, financially, you know, the pros. The, couple has been together all those years. They've saved up. Um, the market is up right now. Their investments are, are doing well. They're able to now part ways and be able to maximize on what they saved um, and each move on separately financially um, and, and assume separate lives in that sense. Um, the con to that is that, as we see quite often, is that there are many couples with gray divorce that, that come here and a spouse has asked them for a divorce and now they're terrified financially. Well, where do I go? I, I didn't work during the marriage and you know, what do I do next? You know, and so this is kind of the other side of it um, where there's financial uncertainty, there's financial um, uh, worry and concern and, and um, so perhaps that's the cons of, of um, you know, gray divorce from a financial perspective. Mm -hmm. And I would think from a health perspective, a lot of people would be afraid to make this move because they're afraid they're going to be alone when they're older. Mm -hmm. They're going, they, their, their health isn't good and who's going to help me, who's going to take care of me, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Right, and, you, and, we, and we have cases like that where couples get to 55, 60 and <clears throat> they're on the back. They're on the let's say back stretch. They're they're approaching retirement, and some of them are not in the best of health. And then we have to talk about certainly you know health insurance and those issues too, and the cost of health insurance. Um, and that makes it more difficult for that particular spouse to divorce because there's there's a financial practical need for health insurance on my own, and then there's also an emotional worry about you know it, you know. Can I take care of myself? Am I healthy enough? I don't have my spouse anymore. So yeah, absolutely, we see that on both ends. And this may not be a question for you. This might be more a question for a therapist than an attorney. But since couples are coming into your office and saying, I want to get a divorce, do you find that, and I'll clarify this, do you find that modern technology is playing a part in this. So in my practice as a licensed marriage and family therapist, a lot of couples who come in on the brink do so because they have so much access to online technology and dating apps and they want to check it out and they're curious and it goes to places that they never anticipated. Mm -hmm. Do you see any of that? Well, as a mediator, you know, I have to remain objective and neutral. So as you pointed out earlier, we, I don't get involved, nor should I get involved in emotional aspects of the divorce. However, <clears throat> you know, technically, yes, but, but, I, but I suspect, and, you know, based on my perception and, and sense of uh, certain individuals in gray divorce that come into our mediation room, uh, there, there is some of that going on be, because... You know, with the advent of all this social media, it makes one curious. It makes one curious. You know, what what could life be on the other side? Whereas before, without these apps and without this access to all this information and opportunities that are presented to them for other relationships in a better life, uh, they didn't have that years ago. So now, yeah, there's that curiosity factor. You know, what is life on the other side? What is What could that look like for me? I can tell you that a lot of my clients will come in and they'll start asking me about advice. These are clients who have decided they're going to get divorced and they're thinking about their next steps. And they start asking me advice about online dating and I laugh and I say, the last time I went on a date we didn't have a computer. <laughs> I might not be the person to ask about Hopefully that tell them, tell them with caution, I yeah, <laughs> I can share stories about people who've had experiences, but that's as much as I can help you with that one. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a whole different world out there, and I do see it creating chasms in marriages that didn't exist mm -hmm. before. 
Ray points at Ray point. Older marriages generally mean older children. What role, if any, do you see the adult children playing? Mm -hmm. Well, it's an excellent question because uh, this issue does come up. You know, although as the mediator, I tell the couple the children are what we call emancipated adults. They're not subject to child support from the legal sense or child custody. They can uh, play in a very, very important part or uh, a very important dynamic in that particular divorce emotionally. So I think of a couple that I had over the last couple of years, and their uh, two grown children were completely distraught by this divorce. Um, they actually convinced their parents to go to mediation because it would be a kinder, gentler way of ending the marriage. And the parents thanked them, and they were, um, uh, and they did not regret their decision. Um, and the case is almost over now; it's almost finished. They can't discuss it in the particulars. But um, what I offered, which I typically do not do as part of our program, was to to bring in the children after the the divorce was completed to speak to them about what this new normal now is going to look like with their parents, you know, and I haven't met with them yet, but I, but we'll be doing so soon. And again, I, I'm, it's something I'm excited about meeting with them because we don't normally do it, but it speaks to the idea that, you know, it doesn't matter how old children are, they're affected by divorce in some way, some shape or form. And just because they turn 18 or become 21 or of legal age, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, a button gets turned off and they're, they're, they're cool with divorce all of a sudden. You know, you know I've seen the, the effects uh, uh, on children go through their 30s, 30, 35 years old, you know, and um, it, it's never an easy pill to swallow for children. And I can tell you, too, from my office, from the family therapy side of it, that I find the same thing, that I have had families with adult children in their 30s and 40s mm -hmm. who have been devastated, mm -hmm. confused, and have needed a lot of help and support in just trying to negotiate what do we do for holiday dinners and how do we not get into loyalty conflicts and all the same kinds of things you would expect from younger, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm young children mm -hmm. as opposed to adults. And, and especially with the non-married children. When they're married, you know, those dynamics still are still in play in terms of family holidays and where do we go and things like that. And is mom and dad gonna be at the table, et cetera. But where we run into trouble um, with ch adult children is the ones that are typically un not married. They're adult, they're emancipated, but they're not married. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be still very confused by what's happening. And haven't needed to negotiate those family issues that we all have to figure out when we do get married or mm -hmm. when we do partner up. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that doesn't change when they become adults. Mm -hmm. And then what about, are you seeing yet any gay couples who have been together for 20 years took advantage of the window of being able to get married and are now saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that? Well, we've, frankly, we've had very few um, same-sex couples thus far, and, and we hope that trend continues. And, and I, one of the things, that I, you know, um, I've had this question before, and uh, hopefully this is what the trend will be with that, in that um, a same-sex couple, if you think about the plight um, that got them there, uh, that got them to this this place now where they now are legally permitted and they fought for so many years. Uh, my thought is that be, all that fighting and strife that they went through for so many years to gain this equality, to gain this, this, uh, this legal authority now they've been looking for for so many years, perhaps makes them think, you know what, we, we worked so hard to achieve this, let's try to make this work now. And let's try to stay together. Even in bad times, you know, let's try to work it out. And you may have seen a greater incidence of same-sex sex couples in your practice as well, trying to do that. Uh, but we haven't seen as many in our practice. And again, I hope that that trend continues. What I tend to see in my practice with same-sex couples are younger couples who have not 
figured it out yet and are mm -hmm. hoping to figure it out for the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or who got married impulsively because, hey, mm -hmm. I can now, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then realized that <coughs> maybe they weren't as prepared as they thought. Right, and that's the other side of it. And, and you would expect some of that to happen as well, this sort of this impulsivity of, now I can do it, so let's do it. And is it the right thing to begin, to begin with for us to do it, you know, so that, but again, you know, so far we haven't seen, you know, a, a great incidence of uh, same sex wanting to mediate mm -hmm. for divorce. Okay, let's say I go home after we're finished here today and my husband says to me, you know, I think it's done. Let's get a divorce. What do I do? Don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> We know each other too well. Yeah, well, um, there'd be a conflict there. <laughs> well, you know, and, and this is what I would say to anyone in this situation. I, at first, the first thing I would do is ask them to, if they have, they still are on a communicative level with their spouse, to re-engage their spouse, to really try to understand why is it that they want this. Try to understand what are the reasons, because spouses... Sometimes they can ask for a divorce. They don't even know why they want it, but they just, this is what they feel they want. And try to understand the specific reasons for why they want it. See if any of it, any of, any of the, um, based on the reasons, see if the marriage can be salvaged first. That's the first thing you want to, to look for. Um, and make efforts in that direction. Uh, but ultimately, if it doesn't work, you always want to try to pursue an amicable resolution first, whether it's through mediation, whether it's through some type of other type of collaborative means, short of lawyering up and going to court. You know, that should always be a last resort unless it absolutely can't be avoided. Um, but that's how I would approach it. Try to salvage things, especially, Linda, in your case, a long-term marriage, you know, you, you had a lot of good years, let's try to salvage that. If it can't work, let's pursue, you know, a, a, an amicable, more efficient option uh, in which we're not at each other's throats and we are actually concerned where we each other lands after that divorce, if we have to do it, if it has to happen. You refer to mediation as a kinder, gentler process. Can you tell me a little bit about what Mainline Family Law Center does to create that? Sure, sure. Well, um, I always tell couples mediation is what the two of you make of it. So when couples come to our come to our door, they're very carefully screened. First of all, they have to be somewhat amicable with one another. It doesn't have to be perfect. They're getting a divorce, you know, uh, but they have to have a certain present with a certain dynamic that would be right or appropriate for the process. And if it's not right, we don't work with them. So um, when I say kind or gentler, um, if a couple comes to us and expresses an interest to mediate their divorce together through our, one of our programs, um, we let them know very clearly up front what is at stake, how they're going to need to come to the process, you know, and what mindset they're going to need to come to the process and, and we do our firm does a lot of work around that we have them uh, take assessments written assessments I have phone calls with each of them called mediation mindset um, uh, profile phone calls in which I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of them uh, to make sure they understand and what what other concerns do they bring to the process to absolutely make sure that they're going to be going to be able to approach it in the right manner um, so Success in mediation is very much uh, how we assess a couple at the outset, okay? There's a, there's a very careful discernment uh, of that couple. And once we've done that work, in most cases, we, we tend to bring in the right couple for the process. And you also will bring in ancillary supports to help the process, yes? Yes, absolutely. So we, we are... A resource center as well in that sense so if, if an individual spouse or a couple uh, needs emotional additional emotional support through counseling and therapy and discernment counseling such as the um, the service that you uh, offer uh, financial support tax tax help you know all these issues that come up in a divorce around tax and um, maintaining my finances what does my financial future look like financial planning 
you know, we offer supports there. Uh, career coaching, life coaching, um, helping that individual or that couple with what the new normal is going to look like on the other side. It's very daunting. And, and so because I can't offer those supports in my role as mediator, there are times where we recognize that certain, certain of those supports are needed and we can refer them out to professionals like yourself uh, that can offer that extra bit of support that that couple or that spouse needed in order to successfully navigate the process. There are two things that I have always appreciated about the collaboration that we've done together. One is that when couples come in to you for mediation, when you sense that there's a hesitancy, mm -hmm. you don't just plow right in. You say, let's take a pause mm -hmm. before you move forward with this here is a next step you might want to consider. Yes. And that is a very, very, very kind thing to be doing and very useful thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. And because, as you know, when, you've, when they come to me, about a third of the people you send end up deciding, you know, we're not ready to end this marriage. We do want to go into marriage mm -hmm. counseling. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I do appreciate is your systemic approach where it's not just my job is to handle the divorce, go figure the rest out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's <clears throat> wonderful that you have had a vision of changing the way divorce can be done. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and uh, that's why we're in existence to change the culture perhaps in the way that divorce gets done in our community in our area and we've been doing this uh, for quite a while now and um, we're, we're going to continue that uh, in good faith and we're going to, to help as many couples as we can. Chris Pistori of Mainline Family Law Center, thank you again for being my guest today. Again, pleasure is all mine. Thank you for watching Radnor Studio 21. This is Linda Hirschman of the Couples and Family Wellness Center. Watch us next time on Relationship Matters.